Hi there! Last month, a reader of my blog on LNEasy.com asked me a question about the possibility of measuring the resistivity of a powder mixture he created. We initiated a private conversation on the topic, and we ended up agreeing to work together to make such a measurement. He would provide me with the powder he created, and I would make the measurement for him, since he doesn't have the lab resources for such task. We also agreed that I would use this opportunity to make a video on how to take this kind of measurements. This is that video. Enjoy! I received the material for running the test in just a week, although coming from Belfast, Ireland. It was packaged in a double-layer plastic envelope, given that it is a very light powder and can go airborne very easily. To avoid spreading it across my whole lab, I handled it wearing a mask so that my breath would not make it fly all over the places. The mask helped also in preventing me from breathing it. Given the consistency of this powder, I had to think at a way to easily shape it in a form that would be kept intact while I was taking the measurements on it. So I had to create a container that would also provide some sort of electrons to electrically connect the powder to my DMM, digital multimeter. But let's proceed in order, and let's begin with some general information about resistivity and methods to evaluate it. Let's start by providing a formal definition of the electrical resistivity. That is the property of any conductive material that defines its resistance to an electric current in terms of its shape and dimensions. If we take a material in the shape of a cylinder, for example, the resistivity is the ratio between the electric field applied at the two bases of the cylinder and the resulting current density. If you think about it, the electric field applied to the cylinder can be translated into a voltage per unit of length, while the current density is nothing else than a current per unit of area. If we consider the ratio between the applied voltage and the resulting current, we obtain a resistance. Such resistance is a function of the length of the conductor and the area of its sectional surface. The constant that correlates the resistance with the length and the area is what is called resistivity, usually indicated with a Greek letter rho. Experimentally, we also notice that the resistivity depends also on the temperature of the material, on the impurities in the material, and on the mechanical stress to which the material is subject. Therefore, when making a resistivity measurement, we also have to specify such conditions, in particular the temperature and the stress. So, how do we make such a measurement? Of all the methods that have been used to do such a thing, the two most relevant are the four-point method and the Whiston Bridge method. The first is normally used to measure the resistivity of thin films or bulk materials. The second is normally used to measure the resistivity of a material in the form of an electrical wire of known length and cross-sectional area. Let's see how each of these methods work, and let's start with the Whiston bridge. Here is the schematic of the test setup. We have a bridge made of four resistors, R1, R2, R3, and Rx, where Rx is the one made with the material we need to explore. A reference voltage is applied at the two opposite ends of the bridge. A reading of the voltage is done across the bridge. When the bridge is well balanced, the voltage across will be zero volt, and that happens when the cross multiplication of the resistor values are the same. With this setup, we put on the bridge the resistor Rx, and we manipulate the resistor R1 until the balance voltage is zero. Applying the formula now on the screen, we calculate the value of Rx. The four-point method works in a totally different way. Basically, we set up a circuit to measure the voltage at the two ends of the conductor once a known current is flown through the conductor itself. We apply the current generator at the points A and D of the conductor, and we read the generated voltage at the points B and C. Assuming we have a very high impedance voltmeter, such an instrument will not affect the reading by deriving current from the conductor. 
And additionally, the resistance of the wires used for connecting the conductor to the current generator and to the voltmeter will not affect the measurement because the voltage drops across the cables don't have parts into the equation. It is therefore a very precise measurement, and the precision of it is mostly the one of the voltmeter and the current generator combined. Once we have the values of voltage and current, we can insert them in this equation, where we will also insert the length and the cross-sectional area of the conductor, and we obtain the value of the resistivity. Once we have the resistivity of the material, it is easy to calculate the resistance of a wire or a generic conductor made out of that material by simply measuring the length of the conductor and its thickness using a simple formula R equals rho times L and divided by A. Now, because the resistivity measurement can be done with a great precision with the four-point method, given that I do have a lab instrument capable of automatically performing such measurement and calculate the result with a four and a half digit precision, I decided to use this method over the Whitstone bridge. Note that I will actually measure the resistance obtained by dividing the voltage by the current involved in the measurement circuit. Once the resistance of the sample is measured, I will be able to calculate the resistivity by inverting the formula normally used to calculate the resistance. Since I have a powder to measure, I have to use a container to hold it, which would also allow me to easily add electrons to connect the instrumentation. The first choice for a container was the one that resembles an actual commercial resistor, a cylinder. I actually designed two of them, thinking of using both to average the measurements. The design consisted of a simple pipe with caps that would fit the two ends to trap the power inside. Also, the caps would be used to pass through the conductors attached to metal plates on the inside of the caps that will establish the contact with the powder. You can see here the printed vessels for the experiment. Unfortunately, I didn't design the holes in the caps, I just forgot about them, but I made them later on using a drill. Then I inserted a screw on each hole from the inside, after fitting on each a couple of metallic washers with the function of conductive metal plates. On the outside, I added extra wiring connectors to make it easy to connect my digital multimeter. After installing a cap to one end of the first cylinder, I started filling it with a mix of graphite and ash, which is the powder I have in my hands. That actually wasn't an easy task, since the powder tended to remain attached all over the places rather than going into the pipe. But I did it, and finally closed the pipe with the second cap. However, while doing that, the pressure of the air between the cap and the pipe expelled some powder, so I decided to seal the cap with some tape to stay on the safe side. Unfortunately, that did not help, as enough dust came out of the pipe to make the power inside lose enough to compromise the readings, but unfortunately I discovered that only later on. I started with a shorter pipe. Given its dimensions, I established the formula to obtain the resistivity from the measured resistance. Unfortunately, something happened with my video camera and I lost the recording of the measurements taken with the short pipe. However, I can tell you that I measured initially a resistance of 2.6 kilo ohm, therefore obtaining a row of 4.082 ohm per meter, which is very high for this kind of material. I realized that the measurement did not work when I started tapping on the external surface of the pipe and the resistance reading started changing substantially. Only at that point, I figured that while capping the pipe, I lost enough powder to leave it very loose inside the pipe, so the method I employed was incorrect. The good thing about this first attempt is that I learned a couple of important things. First, I had to create a vessel that would not lose powder while I was closing it. Second, I had to make a vessel in such a way that I could change the pressure of the powder inside to see how that would affect the value of resistivity. The first thing I thought it was still another cylinder, this time closed with a piston that I could use to apply pressure on the powder. 
However, this solution presented some design problems that I didn't want to spend too much time to solve. So I ended up using a totally different shape, the one you can see in this new design. Besides a different shape of the cross section, which was now squared, the major difference in this design is the position of the opening. Instead of having two openings at the two ends, I created a device with a single opening going through the whole length of the device. That way, a single cap could be used to close the hole and also act as a piston to compress the dust. And sure enough, this time I didn't forget to design the holes for the probes at the two ends of the squared pipe. When mounting the probe terminals, this time I didn't use washers like in the previous case. Instead, I used this coating that, once dried, leaves a layer of pure silver on the treated surface. This has two advantages with respect to the previous solution. First, a thick layer can be laid down very easily and uniformly. Second, silver is the best conductor known on the face of the planet, and so its interference with the precision of the measurement is really negligible. And so, once I fitted the screws across the holes, I distributed thick layers of coating on each end of the vessel on the inside, of course, assuring a good electrical connection with the powder inside the vessel, as you can see here. And this is the lid, very easy to put on the opening without disturbing too much the powder. I also 3D printed a lab spoon to handle the powder more easily, and I used it to fill the vessel with the material. Well, actually, I still made a mess on the table, because this sort of dust goes easily all over the places. I stopped filling the vessel once I reached a height of 5 mm, then I cleaned up the top of it the best I could, and carefully covered everything with the lid. Note that the lid is made of a very light piece of PLA, so its weight is negligible compared with atmospheric pressure acting on it. And, to prevent the lid from moving or to change the pressure inadvertently, I fixed it in place with some masking tape. The whole thing is done in such a way that there is no extra pressure applied to the dust. However, if I use my fingers to push on the lid itself, I can still manually apply some extra pressure to see how it affects the resistivity of the material. It was now time to make a new set of measurements, so I fired up my DMM, I set it up to do the four-point resistance measurement and connected the four probes to the external connectors of the vessel. Then I took my first reading, which was of 20.9 ohms, much smaller than the previous one. I also shook a little bit the vessel to make sure the powder was packed but not under additional pressure, and the reading did not change, and that was exactly what I wanted to see. And with that reading, I calculated the value of the resistivity at the atmospheric pressure, which was 10.45 ohm per millimeter, or 0 0.01045 ohm per meter. And of course, I also noted the temperature of the room during the experiment, which was about 72 Fahrenheit, or 22 degrees Celsius. Temperature changed the value of the resistivity, so it is important to know the temperature reading during the experiment. I then repeated the process applying pressure on the vessel lid and made a few readings at different pressure values, recording all the numbers I took. I found that increasing the pressure would lower the resistivity until I reached a pressure of 22.563 kPa on top of the atmospheric pressure. At that point, any increase in pressure did not produce a decrease in the resistivity towards about the pressure measurements, which were an important part of the procedure. I basically used this precision scale to measure the weight exercised by my fingers on the lead. Then, knowing the area of the lead exposed to the powder, I was able to calculate the actual pressure. At that value of pressure, and higher, I measured the resistance of 9.20 ohm, and therefore a value of resistivity of 4.6 ohm millimeter, or 0 0.0046 ohm meter. With that value and the previous measurements at different pressures, I was able to determine that the resistivity decreased almost linearly with the increase of the pressure, and came out with this graphic representation. At the end, this was a nice exercise. 
Although I knew the theory of taking resistivity measurements on materials, I never had to do it with a material in the form of powder, especially a powder so thin and light. And it was really fun having to overcome all the issues I had to face to make the measurement work and be reproducible. Hopefully this was also fun and interesting for you to follow. If you have any other challenges for me to work with, please tell me about them in the comments. I will certainly accept them gladly and show you how to approach and solve them in future videos. And should I not be able to go through one of these challenges that you will propose, I will still talk about them and who knows, maybe somebody will be able to give me a hint to find a solution to the problems. I'll see you in the next video and in the meantime, happy experiments!